So yeah, um, we, we do quite a few things uh, at the Banking Commission on blockchain or related to blockchain, but uh, you have certainly also heard and read all the news articles that Tim uh, recently writes about all these blockchain projects that the ICC is involved in. Um, to be honest, um, I'm not really speaking about Perlin, about uh, trade flow and trade trust and all these projects today, but we can certainly, uh, if you want, we can discuss a bit at the end. Um, most of those projects are really handled by John, uh, Secretary General's team directly, where we're not so much involved in, but, uh, but yeah, uh, let's just jump into, into a bit of detail. So, so I will start with like a very brief, uh, hopefully not too technical crash course on what is blockchain. And uh, really the, the idea is, I just discussed it with Tim, really just interrupt me or ask questions, or we can also have like a, a discussion, uh, not just at the end of this presentation. And then uh, the second part, it's more like various use cases uh, of blockchain. Um, what is out there, but also what, what ICC is doing. So what, what is really important to know for you, blockchain, what it is and what it's not. And blockchain, it's not Bitcoin. Uh, so you often when you speak with some people say, well, blockchain has such a bad reputation or blockchain is something I would never trust because uh, I was reading a few articles about Bitcoin. And then I often say, well, you need to kind of keep those two uh, items a bit separate. Uh, Bitcoin, well, certainly has some questions uh, about reputation. Blockchain maybe as well, but maybe for different reasons. So, um, so a very, very brief definition of what is blockchain uh, you see in this blue box. And to be honest, this definition is from, uh, from Wikipedia. But basically, blockchain is an open, distributed ledger that can record transactions between two or several parties efficiently and can be verified in a permanent way. So basically what does it mean? Um, open means, um, well we see this in a minute, it's basically open for all people who are involved in this specific transaction. Then distributed means here that, um, well you see this nice old book, it's um, that basically everyone who is involved in a blockchain transaction has this kind of book or a copy of this book uh, for themselves and yeah the lecture in this in this uh, uh, this symbol is a bit this book this this register uh, p2p it's peer-to-peer -peer where um, where two parties or several parties uh, transact with each other and then verifiable that that's very important so it can be at all time you can consult this book even two years ten years later um, and permanently. So permanently, well, it speaks for itself. Um, just a bit going more into detail uh, when it comes to terms or definitions. Um, often when you read blockchain, uh, you also see the, the term uh, distributed ledger technology. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it goes maybe a bit more into uh, how the, the architecture, how the IT architecture is designed, but basically the overarching um, circle here is distribu distributed ledger technology and then blockchain is one specific DLT and Bitcoin is a, a cryptocurrency, a digital currency that is based on the technology uh, that's called blockchain. Um, so very briefly and we go into detail a bit later, where is blockchain coming from? Um, so 2008, um, roughly 10 years ago, uh, in September, we had uh, the breakdown from uh, an American bank, investment bank called the Lehman Brothers. And with that, the financial crisis really, really started. Um, so the financial crisis didn't really start then. It started already a bit earlier, but uh, I think the, the wider public got alerted when this bank uh, uh, went bankrupt. And not even one month later, uh, a document appeared somehow mischievously on the, on the internet. That's called the, um, the technical title is uh, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, electronic cash system. And it's written by a gentleman called Satoshi Nakamoto. And today, actually, this person, no one knows if this person really existed, if it's a group of, group of people. Um, but this, this, uh, this white paper 
made kind of a huge buzz and all IT people around the world and bank people got excited when they, they got to see the details. And it basically describes a system where you don't need uh, what's called the intermediary. And uh, maybe jumping a step ahead, um, during the financial crisis, um, the suspiciousness against banks and governments uh, uh, became bigger and bigger, so no one really wanted to trust banks. That's why I, I kind of put those two uh, a bit in, in the same context. And the dream of these uh, people behind this uh, blockchain or Bitcoin white book was basically that you can get rid of all, uh, all intermediaries. And intermediaries in this context can be a bank, can be government even, can be stock exchange or electricity company. So the dream is really that you can transact with someone directly without uh, needing someone else to confirm your transaction. So on these two pictures uh, below, you see basically the, the two extremes. So on the left, left hand, it's what's mostly the case uh, that uh, you have all kinds of people around one specific middle point, which yeah, is maybe the bank. And on the other hand, it's kind of the people govern or transact amongst themselves. Um, so unclear so far, I guess. <laughs> so okay, let, let's let's take this uh, this totally uh, anonymous example, uh, David and Olivier. Um, when I want to pay Olivier some money, well, it's hopefully not the case. Hopefully, it's the other way around. Uh, <laughs> but um, I usually would go to the bank and would tell this bank I want to pay Olivier hundred euros. And then the bank uh, takes my money, puts it somehow in the system and Olivier gets informed that uh, he has 100 euros now on his bank account. In a blockchain transaction, I would not go to the bank directly, but would just go to the, basically go to the blockchain. Uh, um, and you see all kind of little dots in the blockchain, you call them nodes. And the nodes are basically all the participants of a blockchain. They all get a copy of this, uh, information that David wants to pay Olivier 100 euros and then when each of these nodes approves this uh, or basically validates this, uh, this transaction Olivier gets uh, the 100 euros from, from David. Um, when you say you go to the blockchain, where do you go? So let, let's maybe, maybe one step ahead or, or maybe so basically you uh, a blockchain is like an IT tool. So it's like uh, a bit the better teams that we have at the moment. Uh, most of us uh, have access to these teams. So basically you can just, um, uh, here it's really kind of the whole series of how a blockchain transaction works. So a user requests for a transaction. And here's like David would request uh, a transaction, a payment of 100 euros to Olivier. And you can put this into this uh, IT tool. And then at the same time, you have maybe also other transactions like uh, Victoria would pay Anna 100 euros and so on. And within a certain time frame, usually it's between 10 and maybe 15 minutes, you have a huge list of all these transactions and they would go into one block. So just uh, take this for, for a moment. So that, that's kind of one block which groups all the various transactions within a time frame. Um, then this block, um, will be well here broadcasted or shared with all people in the blockchain with all the nodes in the blockchain so you have a series of uh, um, every 10 minutes you will get every participant of a blockchain would get a, a new block then this block gets uh, validated and validated means uh, all users will check okay does David have 100 euros because he wants to pay 100 euros to uh, Olivier or does he not even have money is David a, a kind of a legitimate participant of this blockchain and so on. There's a few points that all participants would, uh, would check to validate. And once this block is validated, it will be basically uh, approved, added to the blockchain, and then the payment uh, is executed by, by the blockchain system. And I will go back to this a bit more in detail. Clear, unclear so far. So here it, it's basically the same explained again. So you have on the top, you have the various transactions, Sebastian to Marcus, Gustav to Stephanie, Julia to Martin. 
Um, those are the lists of the transactions and then they, they will all go into this, in this uh, system, in this blockchain. All the messages are grouped in the block and will be shared with all participants. Then they are validated and then they integrated in an in a approved or validated block. Sure. Who are the people in the nodes? How do they get pulled into this? So, also, um, I will speak about this a bit in a minute. So basically you have various blockchains, um, architecture, ones and more public. Public uh, Bitcoin, for example, is a public blockchain where everyone can participate. But most of the company blockchains are private. So you need to have an invitation. You need to have maybe a due diligence check uh, to participate in this, uh, this blockchain. One question. One block contains many transactions that need to be verified. What happens if the, one of those transactions fails? The block is not verified? So usually you have, uh, what I didn't say here, you have more than one block in parallel. And um, so for example, if the nodes don't approve this block, the block just uh, disappears. Or the, the block is still there, but it's not approved and it's not attached to the chain. And then, so the payment is not executed. And that's the individual transaction or it's a group of different transactions which are not validated? So usually it's the entire block that it's not validated. So in this case, uh, you maybe just need to reissue your, your transaction if you think it's a valid transaction. And the people making verifications, are they volunteers or where do they come from? So, is this the next? So, so here maybe that, that's the that explains a little bit. Validation, it's, uh, it's actually here or in, in the, the technology, it's called a consensus mechanism. And there are different consensus mechanisms and different architecture how the blockchains are designed. In Bitcoin, as I said, it's like um, everyone can participate and the consensus mechanism is also that everyone has to approve. Then you have a, a different one in the company, it's sometimes uh, just a few selected uh, nodes that are the kind of the, the chosen ones basically. So it's really, it's a bit a question how fast you want to execute uh, a consensus. For example, if everyone here needs to approve one, one transaction, it might take a bit more time. But if only, if I say, okay, only the first row, for example, would have to validate the transaction, then maybe you can execute it a bit faster. So that's basically a bit uh, the, the different consensus mechanism. Yeah. But if, um, if for example, um, you owe Oliver money, <coughs> was that the example? Was it the other way around? I, yes, I pay Oliver so, money. Yeah. And we would need to validate, and we're, I don't know, about 50. If half of us thinks that uh, you're a very greedy guy and therefore we would not validate and the other ones thinks that Oliver is a very greedy guy and would not validate. Is that what you would call the central authority of appeal or would, I mean, whether if there are underlying legal reasons or whatever, not legal reasons to not validate, we're stuck. So in most of the current blockchains, it's 51% need to approve. So it's really like in a, in a democratic voting process. But then in others, it's not 51%, but for example, you say like two thirds need to approve um, on the legal question. What, what, do, you, what do you mean? I like mean, if, you, if you don't agree with uh, 26 of us not yeah. validating your claim or your, you know, the fact that you think that okay. you owe money, what can you do? Okay, I guess. Yeah, um, it's actually a good question. I, I don't even know. I think there's no way to appeal this uh, appeal this decision. I don't think so. But yeah, it's, uh, I can look it up. I don't know. Good question. No, because we talk a lot about arbitration and blockchain mm -hmm. in the banking and financing sector. Mm -hmm. I thought that was. I'm trying to understand yeah. how that would come in. I was thinking maybe it's the need of a central authority to kind of say. You know, the 26 persons think yeah. you're greedy, maybe we need to check who they are. Right. Well, it's interesting when you say central authority because that's exactly the point that you don't have one. But what's very important yeah. is that you define the rules uh, of a blockchain transaction, of, of a blockchain system. And usually when you have a company blockchain system, they spend a lot of time to define exactly these rules. Uh, who and. I mean, I come to this a bit later, but ICC is now 
establishing uh, a center in Singapore. It's called Digital Trade uh, Standards Initiative, where we exactly try to um, to establish certain rules or standard procedures uh, for blockchain. But yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the financing model. So, for example, uh, who, how do you finance the, this platform? Like, are the nodes or the people that will uh, be eventually certified to approve this or to be able to use it? Are they providing some kind of financing to be able to like host the mm. platform? So. So it, it depends a bit. If it's a company platform, usually you have the companies to finance this platform. Um, in Bitcoin, you might have heard of uh, the word mining. So when you're like one of these nodes and you approve uh, a transaction, you get rewarded a little bit. So you get like when you participate in blockchain, you get like a little, little amount of Bitcoin yourself, basically for your work that you did. <coughs> I was wondering because from the language it seems that these are discretionary decisions taken by people, but I can imagine that those are completely automatized. Yeah. So probably being validated or not has something to do with the original structure of the blockchain, yeah, exactly. the information yeah. that's yeah. built into the block. Yeah. So if you were to change or to geopolize or contest the decisions taken, what you have to do is go all the way back to the original code. You know, like yeah, it's, it's kind of been deleted and it's really going to affect all the other building blocks. Yeah. It's, it's purely a matter of, so it, it will depend on how it has been built, whether you're going to be doing it. And therefore, it's who pays this architecture. So it, it's really, really yeah. No, it's really a question about code, as you say. And in company blockchain, you have uh, basically three providers uh, to kind of offer blockchain uh, platforms. One is IBM. Um, Ethereum and then you have R3 and so they build kind of the basic architecture and then top the companies can uh, design a bit their their own blockchain and um, but yet like the code there's not like the fixed code there's really like a, very much an evolution of code but because they discover every day new problems and uh, yeah. So if you were to uh, how a parameter is taken into account for instance to give a decision on some legalistic concept, you don't have to go to maybe IBM to the provider and have to change the architecture. The yeah, architecture. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, here is what I said already. You have, in principle, you have two different systems. One is the public, uh, it's often called the permissionless uh, versus the private and permission blockchain. So on the left hand, you have the public one where everyone is allowed to participate. So you have no restriction. Um, then the problem is here that the, the content mechanism or this approval validation mechanism is usually rather slow. And on the right hand side you have the permission where you need to have an invitation, maybe like a background check because especially like in financial transactions maybe you don't want the whole world to, to let you know that, uh, I don't know, what, what kind of transaction you're involved in. Um, so there's also usually a basic trust in each other. That's why um, the, the background or the, the approval checks are maybe a bit faster. So yeah, like government blockchains, company blockchains are usually rather the private, private one. Um, so when you say accessible for every user, where do you, you have to go purchase a program from IBM to get it on your computer and you have access? Yeah. No, and then second question, when you said about the example you're making the hundred euro payment to Olivia, uh, how are you making the payment? Do you initially have to give your bank details when you sign up to the blockchain? And are you still going through financial institutions for the payment? Can be the case, can be not the case. In, in Bitcoin, the idea is that you remain anonymous, that you have a it's kind of a Bitcoin account, but you need to have someone who trans, well, kind of exchanges your euro money maybe yeah, in, uh, in Bitcoin money. So yeah. You still have to go through financials. It doesn't necessarily need to be a bank, it can be like an uh, online provider and so on. Some are more trustworthy than others, but um, it's, it's still you need someone to do this at least. Yeah. 
usually they call like uh, like stock exchanges for for Bitcoin transactions. And so let, let's have a look at a few advantages of uh, of blockchain because I was mostly talking about money transaction, but uh, blockchain in the end the idea at least is that you have have not just financial transactions and one also a bit for our domain here at ICC is that uh, you can create the uh, original electronic uh, documents and so basically what's what's the point is when I send someone a PDF document no one knows what I did with this PDF before so I could send it to Emily and to 100 other people um, but the, the idea and also the interesting part of a, of a blockchain uh, in this context is that every document, now it gets a bit technical maybe, every document um, is basically um, transformed um, in a certain long number called the, the hash code. And um, so if you have this picture, for you it looks like a picture, but when you can, you can put it in this cryptographic uh, hash function tool, and it transforms into a very long, uh, long number. So, just maybe as a as an example. So I, I can that that's one of these. Uh, it's a simulation for for crypto or for this for this hash function. And on the bottom you see the hash. It's this very long code. And on the top you see like this empty field. And I can write something like uh, I am David. And you see that the number changes immediately. Um, However, when I, for example, spell David not with a capital letter, but I spell it with a small letter, it's not the same, uh, same code. So when, when I go back with a capital letter, however, it's the same code again. So basically, I just want to explain with this that really like every document can be translated in a very long number, figure and letters. And this means that like in a blockchain transaction, when I send someone uh, a document, um, the blockchain would store not just the document but would also like who sends it to whom, at what time, where this other person would be and a few other characteristics and would add it to this, uh, to this hash function. So basically every time when you send a document to someone the hash function or this code would change a little bit. So this means really that uh, it's not just like the normal PDF that I would send some, to someone, it would really be a document that could be afterwards verified to whom and, to, and when I send it to someone. Um, it just sounds that uh, a blockchain does come to revolution like straight, like, uh, particularly on the digitization aspect. Uh, uh, does that mean that we're seeing perhaps the beginning of the end for banks? <laughs> you still have a job in the next year. <laughs> um, can I answer this question at the end? <laughs> sure. You mean like? I mean, how do the how do all the nodes know that you actually have money in your account? So they can go and verify that you're saying Bitcoin company. So why do okay. you have that many nodes? So yeah, in this specific case, everyone would basically have access to my bank account and mm -hmm. could check themselves if I really have this amount of money. In reality, it's not. It's not a physical person. It's really more like an IT tool uh, that verifies. And it's up to you if you only want to define that uh, you have one or two nodes. If you have one node, then we go back basically to the same system. Did you, you have the bank in the middle or like an uh, intermediary? But if you, the idea is really that you don't just need one person to, to verify. Because often, like, you have maybe, you don't really trust this other person. So that's kind of the idea that you trust more in the codes than in the, in the other person or in the other party. But it's the same code, it's just a relation by 
So, but the code is open, transparent, and everyone can verify, make for them themselves the decision if I trust this code or not. <laughs> deal with the point I mean, that you need so everybody is the same copy of the ledger if you think about Bitcoin so you, the more people have the same copy the harder it is for 51% of it to be owned by one person to then change the ledger so this is why the, the strength is in the numbers so if you had 50 nodes if somebody owns 26 as in a, a lens uh, example then potentially they could hack the blockchain and change the ledger retroactively to, to fake transactions so the more you have, the, the stronger the, the network is. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Yeah, if I bribe 51% of you to say that, uh, well, Olivier doesn't need this money or whatever, then you could even, you could really uh, change something. Um, that, that's again why it's very important, kind of how you design this, uh, this structure. Yes, that's true, but... Um, you can hack and you can find out. Yeah, I mean, you, you have certain certain uh, blockchain systems, maybe also Bitcoin, where it's not fully, fully sure how many people really own these nodes. Because just in Bitcoin, for example, you need to be in a place where electricity is very cheap and uh, there's a lot of Bitcoin nodes, nodes in China, for example. but not saying anything. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the second benefit is really the high traceability. Basically, um, every transaction is recorded and also recorded from whom to, to what party the money is going or the, not necessarily the money is going at what time and so on. And um, here I was often talking about financial transaction, but basically um, you can easily replace this, uh, um, what's called the crypto coin, because in reality it's not, not a transaction, just, uh, just uh, a sentence that is transacted, but it's, it's often uh, a coin. It's kind of like a, like a piece of, a, like, like a digital uh, piece of money. So it's basically, it says like, um, when, you, when you take Bitcoin, that, it says like five bitcoins are transacted from person A to person B. But when you think a bit further, you can also just replace the, um, the bitcoin with whatever you want. For example, if I want to give you something physically, if I want to give you, I don't know, um, a bottle of water, no one can verify if I really give you this water. But if you have like a digital twin, what it's called in this system, from a digital water, like a water coin, that I transact five water coins to person B, then you can transact this in a, in a blockchain transaction. And so maybe just to here, it's really one of the big flaws of, uh, of, of blockchain that I was just trying to explain this digital twin. And often, um, but what is actually done because or maybe start with this slide. Here we have oranges. It's, it's hard to kind of follow the origin and uh, the location of uh, oranges, but they often, for example, use uh, a QR code on the box of oranges, and then the QR code is translated in a digital, basically digital coin. Um, so, but as I said, this is one of the, of the big problems. You can, in, a, in a blockchain transaction, it's very easy to transact and uh, certify everything what is dig digital. But when something is not digital, you need to have a kind of a bridge between the digital, the offline and the, and the digital world. And yeah, you have a few tools. Uh, for example, you have sensors. That's why you might have heard of uh, uh, Internet of Things. So like more and more things uh, objects have like a sensor in it and that's really the idea is that you can trace uh, not really the uh, just the digital but basically the sensor that is integrated in something more or less clear <laughs> really just interrupt me um, 
yeah, the, the instant reconciliation uh, and the audit trails is something um, also quite helpful. So you always know, for example, um, with the sensors uh, in the blockchain system, where is the shipping container, where is the specific good, um, and reconciliation is, is often uh, that like when one event happens, uh, another event happens immediately. And well, increased transparency. Um, so like, let, let's uh, make it a bit more practical. I'm sure you all know uh, what this is. So what actually happens, and I'm not a, not a lawyer, so I guess all the lawyer would immediately correct me, but it's, it's, it's often referred to as one of the first smart contracts. So what basically happens, I want to have this, I don't know, bottle of Coca-Cola. I put money in it and at the end, without being really conscious, I have a contract with this uh, selector company that they in return owe me a bottle of Coca-Cola because I inserted the money. And in a blockchain transaction, what is really interesting in the blockchain, if you combine blockchain and smart contracts, so you have um, in, a, in a smart contract, it's really kind of like a, a small software uh, that defines that when something happens, something else happens immediately. So you define what happens and what happens afterwards in a, in a contract. In a, and this contract is smart because it, it executes uh, itself. Uh, and then the event happens. And when the event happens, uh, something else happens. So basically, um, in here, here this example is that uh, when the, in a shipping container, the temperature exceeds a certain, certain amount, uh, you have maybe fish in the container and the fish uh, uh, are not good anymore. So an insurance payment would be triggered automatically or the payment would be tr uh, triggered automatically when the shipping container arrives in a certain port. So that's kind of the, the rough concept of a smart contract. Paulina? Just this translate, for instance, in the info terms and you know, for the court as well, uh, the regulation body of all of this, because it seems that it's evolving quite fast and the uh, mm, governments are not keeping up with it. Yeah, we that, can that, say that the, uh, that's his house's agenda, it's a, it's a good point, yeah. Um, yeah, here you have just a few random examples of where smart contracts are actually already used today. Um, it's really supply chain finance and uh, supply chains and trade is one of the rather first uh, applicants of it. Um, you have, for example, also a copyright protection. You have, um, uh, for example, the company uh, called Spotify is, uh, is trying a lot of um, blockchain and smart contracts. Um, out at the moment, for example, when someone listens to a specific song, you usually have to pay some money to the to the creator or the owner of the song. And in most countries, it, it's really organized in a very tradition traditional way. So, when, for example, this song is played on the radio, there is some person uh, that afterwards check on which radio this this song was played, and then uh, there is kind of a list, and uh, so this. Radio has then to pay a certain amount of money to the to the owner of the song, but um, yeah, there's some kind of test case uh, of Spotify that uh, they would execute the payment immediately to their to their artists, for example. Well, here you see a few uh, cases or use cases where blockchain is already in use. Uh, for example, land re register in a well, here it's, uh, the interesting case is uh, in Honduras. The problem was that, um, I'm not sure if anyone from Honduras is here, um, and apparently uh, it was sometimes difficult to prove that uh, this land where you were building or owning a house is really yours. So you had like a central government owned system, but it's relatively easy then for this, I don't know, for the government or for the person behind this language is to, to change it. And so 
they they established, uh, which is a bit surprising that it's in Honduras, but they established a land register that is uh, based on the blockchain. So basically, uh, not the whole population, but uh, at least certain nodes, certain uh, participants of this blockchain need them to verify if the ownership of uh, one land goes to the next. So it's not just like a piece of paper that you can easily fake. Um, same for companies register in uh, um, certain jurisdictions and in New York apparently the, uh, the way electricity is settled between uh, companies uh, primarily it's, it's already used in blockchain. Um, when you look a bit more, uh, more closer to what we do, trade and trade finance, um, so you have still today that's, that's kind of a more or less typical trade transaction and trade finance transa transaction. You have uh, shippers, uh, companies, customs, and you have a lot of banks involved, insurance companies, and so on. And at the moment, often what happens is that they all use paper documents. So in a typical transaction, you have up to 100 different documents that go back and forth from various parties. So like the bank, for example, um, at the moment they have like seven days to, to receive and check a document and then send it per courier to the next party. And for example, you can only collect a certain good from the port with a specific document. Um, and then sometimes you need hundreds of other different other documents like certificate of origins and so on. And so the idea is that, that um, many of these documents um, they, they go more and more digital and the idea is really by using a blockchain rather than having this back and forth of, a, of different documents, you have like uh, smart contracts that, um, that define when something uh, happens immediately when something else happened. For example, when the, when the, I don't know, the container entered in a certain port, uh, a document or like a confirmation would immediately be sent to the, to the personal company that is allowed to collect the, the goods and the payment would be triggered immediately. For example, we have uh, uh, with, with our friends at the commercial crime uh, center in, in London, we, we, we discussed the tool that, for example, there's a lot of sanctions in trade and sometimes when you export, uh, well, it happens often that uh, when a ship leaves uh, China, for example, uh, they're not allowed to stop in Iran, but sometimes it happens that they stop in Iran. And so like immediately when a container would stop in Iran, kind of alert would be signaled to all kind of involved parties. And for example, uh, if a container is entering the port of Iran, a bank, for example, would not be, um, well, there's some kind of exemption of payment that they're allowed to do. Just like long story short, uh, uh, it would fasten the whole process and make it really much more transparent and easier. It would be Big Brother is watching all the ships. Kind of. That's of course uh, one of the other questions that if you want this, that, uh, that you, you have this system in place. Yeah, That kind of transparency has uh, not just advantages, that's for sure. Um, yeah, we, we recently released a report where we tried to list uh, all kind of the projects that happen in trade and that's really just a small selection. You have like, actually you have way more, but those are the, the more advanced, uh, more like on the supply chain, but also on the trade and the financing side. You have a lot of uh, companies, banks that they group themselves together in consortia and to build up uh, specific blockchain platforms. And the one in the middle, the one with the, the red circle around it, it's this ESI project that we are about to launch in Singapore. The idea is, is really that each of these platforms, they are defining at the moment their own rules, their own governance and, and so on. And the problem is you need to always subscribe to this set of rules. You need to be a member of this blockchain platform. But maybe if your bank or your company that you want to transact is a member of another platform, you need to subscribe to those rules again. So the idea of this digital trade standards initiative in Singapore is basically that you create some kind of common rule books um, 
some kind of ways to, we call it interoperability or interconnectivity between these blockchain platforms. So maybe, we, we don't know, maybe at one point in time there is merger between those platforms, but at least for now you still have more the trend that there are more and more different platforms. So at the moment, that's one of the problems, they're not connected. So it's a bit like you have a Gmail email address, but you would not be able to send an email to someone who is on Hotmail or whatever. And uh, the aim of this DSI is really to kind of reduce this, these barriers between the, the blockchain platforms. Yeah, at the moment, they're all kind of stuck. No, no. Um, and I have a question regarding the, for example, the discussions that now the banks have around this. For example, in the banking commission meetings, when they discuss, I don't know, they have a topic about around the blockchain. What what are like the the main concerns, or how are they trying to mm. keep up? Like, is that the kind of discussions that they're having? So, so this kind of interconnectivity is really a big discussion because they invest a lot of money but they don't really know in which platform they should invest the money so they don't want to just i don't know you have one it's called we trade they're a bit afraid when we put all the money in retrade and we trade will maybe not the player that will succeed and uh, well, then but basically then the banks are just trying to integrate these platforms as an investor not to be left out or to develop their own or well, you, you have to understand that like, when a bank cannot really do this on their own unless they want to just transact with, with their own subsidiaries. But if they often, like in a trade transaction, you have more than one banks involved. So they have to agree which platform they would use. And often, they, like the large banks, they would maybe use five, six different platforms at the moment, but it's quite costly. Yeah, and I think it, sure, but, but I'm not quite sure if they're willing to do it. Again, uh, it's sometimes political because kind of the company who owns the platform can also define the rules. Sometimes you have, uh, well, you have this trade war to be at the moment between US and China. And uh, so maybe US banks rather insist on that platform and Chinese on another platform, just like one example. So yes, but I know, for example, this trade trust or trade flow that the ICC is uh, involved in, it's the Singapore platform. Um, again, I mean, it's just one out of, of many. But the idea is at the moment really that with the standards that we create, we reduce at least a bit the distance between these platforms. computing power and the, the uh, necessary to be really able to use such a system at scale that would involve everybody. I don't know. Good. Well, <coughs> so there's uh, absolutely you could, but most things nowadays have to be off chain or side chain. So really, it's about layers. So if you think about say Ethereum or uh, or three, which is uh, or IBM's Hyperledger. That's all a base layer, it's like the internet, but everything on top of, so all of the projects are, say, apps on top of the, the internet. So these are apps on top of the blockchain. And yes, you could absolutely connect all of the base layers of the blockchain, but no, we would not have the computing power. It would be too, depending on the, how much data you needed to put on the blockchain, it would not be possible. Um, I think in the future, there needs to be, so, my main issue with blockchain in general is in the, as you were talking about, permission versus permissionless. A permissioned blockchain, a private blockchain is a complete paradox because how can you have trust and how can there be transparency if everybody in the same company is the one who owns the, the nodes? So this is where we need to find a balance. You need to find a balance of transparency and a balance of sharing data because you can't share all the data, you have to have it 
public enough, transparent enough, and decentralized enough that you could trust that each bit of data that you want to use is is trustworthy. So this is the it's a balance. I don't know if, if you if this was your last slide, but um, uh, um, I don't know. If, and I don't know if there's anyone from IT in the room, but uh, I don't remember who from IT here who said who told me that actually all this generates so much power, like one digit that you need to transform and that, like all the matrix and all the servers around the world that needs to uh, uh, process. I'm totally not technical, or, and that it costs so much energy that it's actually not at all sustainable or green. It's, it's mm, the opposite. Yes, and no. it's often referred to Bitcoin. Uh, this Bitcoin mining, they, they need a lot of computer power to do this mining and I, I somewhere read that kind of it's the equivalent of the electricity of one year in Nigeria or something but um, it's, it really depends a bit as you say like the, the architecture like in a more private blockchain it's, it's not that it would, would be so energy inefficient as, as blockchain, uh, Bitcoin And the banker is not getting into his car yeah, to go to the, the bank, paper or, or the paper or all that, right? So there is there is an offset there as yeah. well, and, and then there's the obviously the any efforts that are made by um, companies, um, you know, that manage uh, huge data um, data centers. Um, you know, the cloud is it's at one point physical in some place. Um, they their efforts to to do that in a carbon neutral or or uh, or even in a carbon minus way, because there are some efforts to do that as well. Okay, I think I'm always at the end. Well, this is another ICC project. It's kind of a online discussion forum uh, where we invite primarily public organizations and uh, international organizations to discuss a bit what works well in blockchain, really trade related blockchain in trade, what does work not so well and what, what are points that uh, maybe the international community should address and uh, also what ICC could do to, to make it work better. Um, yeah, you, you have like, that's really just a rough list of various uh, blockchain in trade uh, applications and platforms, so almost every country or trading countries is trying out a few tools. Um, this one I found quite interesting that LinkedIn always publishes the, the skills that are most needed or wanted in, uh, in, in every year and apparently blockchain is, is one of the key top 10 skills where you can also increase your salary but not Bitcoin paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just, just to close up, um, what's really critical, um, well it's, it's an old sentence, uh, garbage in, garbage out, but it's basically in everything what is in a, in a blockchain transaction stays there and if this digital twin, this uh, translation of, uh, of the offline good is, is bad then it doesn't make it any better just because there's a blockchain and scaling up is a big problem so often many of these blockchain tools work quite well on a small scale but maybe on a global scale on a larger scale they show a bit difficulties and the last one is uh, this interoperability between these various blockchain networks. Um, yeah, this is kind of decision tree if you want to know if you should build a blockchain in a business application or not. So it's really there's a lot of cases where simply that, that would not make any sense. Um, yeah, this is maybe the last slide. So yeah, there's like, as I said, different ways to that the blockchain uh, architecture could be built and the few points it certainly cost so the more money you have uh, how fast and the, like speed and ability to scale up privacy and uh, vulnerability maybe also for hackers is kind of topics to keep in mind so yeah that's it Thank you.